my experience with the USDA has been very favorable. Um, again, I found them to be very, very customer sensitive. They're very responsive. They can help guide you through the project. Uh, the USDA application can be a little bit maybe overwhelming or intimidating for the first time applicant, but there is a process to it. Um, all of the requirements that are out there I think are very uh, reasonable. I think it's a prudent application process. You do have to get a number of permissions and, and uh, consents from different parties that, that can affect the, the project. Um, and that's, you know, as a taxpayer, that's how I want my money to be spent too. So I'm glad it's a strict process. I think that the, the willingness to share information and collaborate um, does stand your agency apart. You are very responsive. Um, you're very willing to share your expertise and um, work as a true partner as opposed to uh, more um, territorial kind of organizations. So, you know, I, I, it's been excellent. Most of our um, big um, rural water projects um, use the rural development uh, loan to get their uh, projects going. Um, to get water to the residents is, a, is an expensive project and I have to use the, the 40 year uh, loan repayment. So that has been a really good process. Uh, in a nutshell, we really appreciate the opportunities that USDA Rural Development gives small communities. Um, we've had several projects that, ha that you've been involved in, and they lend really good quality of life to our community. Um, we've had assistance with some things like uh, affordable housing. The, our county um, housing authority used your services and that will help us maintain some affordable housing for our community and you helped us with a, an our bag that um, worked with our theater and so not only preserving a piece of history in our community but also offering um, and maintaining some good family entertainment in our community without your help they probably would have had to close and uh, of course like I said Southwest Healthcare that's a be, they're a major player in our community. They're the, ma they're the major employer. And um, also, we're far enough away from health care that we need a critical access hospital and we need a good quality facility and our facility is aging and is desperately beyond updating. So, um, ever so grateful for those programs. And when we first started to form electric cooperatives in the state, we used the Rural Electrification Administration, which was probably their early rural development uh, agency, if you will. Over time, as the mission has broadened to include, you know, more likely all the facilities, I think the partnership has even deepened. I think we see very clearly that to live and work in rural America these days takes the same amount of service and quality of life features that people have in town. And when I say that, I mean you have to have that absolutely reliable electricity, you have to have broadband communication and that kind of telecommunication service, you need quality water, you need quality roads, you have access to medical care. People aren't going to live and work in rural America unless they have that kind of contingent of services. And USDA Rural Development, I think, has understood that and has broadened their mission to say, we can help in all these areas, not just utilities, but in all the areas like that. Because one without the other really doesn't do much good. And that's why I think the partnership between the rural electrics and rural development has been so strong. Because I think we share the same view that rural electricity is wonderful, but in and of itself, it only gets you so far down the road and you have to have that wide range of services to really make a difference. When we rebuilt and uh, built a new water plant, as you probably know, we uh, remodeled our old one, built a new one, and that funding source and the mechanism went all through. Somehow along the line, a document or a piece of paper got lost for about $150,000 to $200,000 of that project. Through the efforts of your staff and our staff, uh, we were able to figure out what happened and working with our engineering firm and resolve that problem uh, to everybody's satisfaction. But again, I think the plus was that even though we had an issue, everybody worked together to resolve it and find uh, a positive solution. 
Oh, where do I even start? USDA Rural Development to me is just this incredible broad sweep of resources and services that we can tap into for a variety of things. You know, I go back to my first house was bought through what was an old farm home loan program back in the early 80s. And that was really my first insight into rural development in general. And, you know, I didn't, I won't tell you that my feelings are the same now as they were then, because it was a completely different agency 30 years ago. Um, but to me, rural development is just like this great big Christmas party of ideas and resources that can help further ideas. If you know anything about me, you know that I love rural America, and you know that I have a passion for the rural areas. And you know, that rural development in the name kind of gives you that illusion that it all kind of fits together, but it's so true. I look at so many of the things that we've done in this region, so many of the resources that we brought to this region that are impacting what we're able to do in this region, whether they're programs or processes or like under um, an R bag, if it's equipment that, that now has a theater in a community. I mean, you, you know, you think about quality of life in communities and, and it's not only about creating jobs and, and creating economies, it's about creating a place where people want to live. We looked at different options in, in Jamestown with uh, folks mainly out of Minneapolis and, and other locations. Um, a lot of times it means a bonding, so they'll sell bonds to investors. Um, that can be a, a very timely process. And the, with the time period I was involved, the market was doing some wild fluctuations and there was not a lot of uh, folks that were rus r rushing to the bond market let's say they're not interested in investing in projects like this they were they were tightening down and, and really uh, being very conservative at those times so you know, we looked at other options through HUD and things like that but the USDA uh, far and away turned out to be the best project I know we really pushed the limits on one of the projects and if I recall correctly, at the time it was the largest uh, healthcare financing project that the USDA had ever done in the U.S. So we we, we pushed a lot of uh, we pushed a lot of buttons with that one. Put, got, we got a lot of support, let's say, uh, from the local congressional folks, Conrad, uh, Dorgan, and Palmer. I were all involved with this project, and as a result, it, it happened. And our home ownership division was very um, complimentary of your guaranteed loan program for your on your single family side and how well that that works with our um, first home mortgage program and so um, we just look forward to more um, activity in the future more interaction between our agencies on both the single family side as well as the multifamily side the first time i ran into usda I was in my 20s working for a regional planning council of Devil's Lake. And one of the projects that we came across was the Great Northern Hotel was vacant. It looked terrible. There was pigeons flying in and out of it. And uh, there was a fellow, the son of the, the Farmers Union Oil Company uh, manager. His name was Gary Stenson. And we'd heard about him. He lived in Minneapolis. He flew his own plane. And he had the idea to convert the, the Great Northern Hotel to senior housing. And people were just laughing about it. And uh, he heard that there was a program with USDA that could do substantial rehabilitation for senior housing. And, and so my first acquaintance with, with USDA was I heard about a guy in, in, in Bismarck, Fred Browning was a housing chief. And through a series of meetings, we got in touch with Fred Browning. And the calculations were that, well, it would be cheaper to build new senior housing than to renovate this. But eventually, Gary was persistent. The facility got renovated. It's gorgeous. The seniors love it. Uh, it. It restored that wonderful old building that's on the National Register. And USDA accommodated that. They helped finance it. And everybody won. But there was a lot of tension. You know, the people on the ground working with the state office doing something a little different. I think back to, you know, when I, when I really, in this particular career, got into the whole USDA um, arena. I'd worked in housing and I'd, you know, 
different things, and so I had a, like a different view to USDA before, and, and always worked well with them. But when I got into this arena, the first real project that I worked with was the High Plains Cultural Center, and that's boy, if that's like a, a just tenacious group who just wasn't going to go away and was working so hard to make something happen. And I still remember coming to USDA and pulling everybody together in, you know, in a really little stuffy room in the back down by the hall where we could, where we could talk and, and really kind of throw down who can do what and how can you help. And that was the first time that I really understood the relationship building part of what USDA could be you know, to help us with projects. And it was the first time that I really understood how you bring all the partners together in a room and you sit down and you talk about what can make things happen. Yeah, some will use the State Health Department EPA money. Um, that's a two and a half percent interest, but it's a 20 year note. So there's only certain circumstances that that will work out. Maybe a water treatment plant, um, they'll go with a 20 year payback. And then like you said, the State Water Commission, we've been able to access some of the oil money for some grants and now they're giving some loans too. But uh, they are well aware of the the USDA funds and want to work hand in hand and don't want to be a replacement because they know it is a valuable asset to the state using those federal dollars. Over the years that I've worked with a number of your staff all across the state, it's been a real pleasure because they understand the problems that small local communities and local development people have. And they really help people move the communities forward. I mean, if you look at North Dakota 20 years ago, uh, it just wasn't a real fun place to be out in rural communities. Uh, uh, the population was decreasing, a lot of really negative things were happening, schools were in trouble, and now with today's environment, uh, having organizations like yours that can go hand in hand with those communities to move forward, I think is important. And, and although there's some infrastructure issues that need to be addressed uh, by the state, I think your organization has really stepped up and helped those communities solve those problems uh, and help them uh, really develop that for themselves. I guess through the years I've accessed the, the Red League program quite a bit and of course we're funded through the RCDG program and also worked a bit with community facilities and REAP and VAPG. So I've worked with quite a few people over there and I have to say that your process actually does help people think about the right steps in economic development. It helps them um, respond to those uh, areas that people really don't want to respond to, like when you say you have to do a business plan. When Once you have to do it and you start doing it, then you realize how you should be developing your project. I think depending on the, the scope of the project and the ability of the organization to afford the project. You know, there's a, a financial forecast or a financial feasibility study required for most of these projects. And sometimes, and it's not been my experience, but I know an organization may have a, a vision of a larger project than they can actually afford. And, and, and having that financial forecast done is kind of a grounding process and it keeps the scope of the project intact and really where it should be. One of the things I've always liked about the uh, relationship with USDA is that USDA's application process forces local people to get organized. You have to have a sources and uses page. You have to get credit worthy. If you didn't have that discipline, whether you use USDA programs or not, I like them because of that. You know, um, this is going to sound kind of brown nosing, and I don't mean it to be, but I think that rural development to me is one of the most approachable agencies that we work with. I can honestly say that I, when, I, when I'm sitting here and I'm thinking about all the different people that we work with in the rural development system in our state, you know, from Jasper down to Melvier and Dickinson to you, Josh, to, you know, Dennis or um, any of those people. It's always an easy phone call. It's always a good conversation. It's always, how can we help? You know, here's what you're thinking, or you're absolutely crazy today, Rayanne. That isn't going to fly at all. Our program isn't going to work. I, I'm not going to say that the other federal agencies don't have personality or that they don't have approachability. I just think that 
USDA is just a little bit more, I want to use the word family friendly, but, but it, if, if you think about the family of services that we provide, that's really kind of what it is. It's an easy place for me to call. I think that the people that I work with, hands down, are good partners. I never ever feel that I can't make that call, that I can't ask the question, that I can't seek the help. You know, I think staff has had an excellent working relationship. Um, you know, I can talk about my experience before I became executive director when I worked over in the Planning and Housing Development Division. Um, excellent rapport, willingness of USDA staff to share information, um, particularly on the multifamily side, to make sure that we were not oversubsidizing projects, um, you know, appropriate layering. Um, when your 538 guarantee program was involved with our federal tax credits, um, we needed to make sure that there wasn't that oversubsidization. Um, good um, experience in sharing um, operating uh, expense projections to make sure that we were getting similar information. Yes, I would say I would rate the customer service uh, of rural development very high. Uh, again, uh, they are in North Dakota. Uh, they, you know where their offices are. You know where they work. You know, you you get to know them during the course of a project because you have so much interaction with them. And they're always available. Uh, if they're not, if you leave a message, they get back to you. Well, actually, I consider USDA staff my colleagues because they are the first people that I contact in about any project that I work with. You guys are so heavily involved in. Rural development, you have the funding to help out all of those areas. So um, I guess I actually joke quite a bit with the people that I call over there saying, it might be easier if I just had a desk right there. It goes from every field office I've ever worked with. Uh, not only was I the mayor of Carrington, but I was a professional developer and covered nearly the entire state and had the pleasure of working with just about every office you have in North Dakota. And it goes without saying that each office and every staff person had put a real priority on customer service. Uh, I personally, if I have two locations to go for something, uh, a service, I'm going to go where the customer service is better. It doesn't matter what the price is. It's about customer service. And in reality, your programs aren't any different. There are other agencies that you might be able to work with, but you're going to work with the people that provide the customer service, the friendliness, the cooperation, uh, trying to figure out the the pitfalls or the gray areas that need to be addressed in a very uh, upbeat manner and working as a team and I think that's the real plus of your organization and that can't be said about every federal or state or even regional organization so uh, to me it's just a shining light of the uh, uh, service and, and the personnel that you have today. We have field staff that uh, meet with uh, your guys's office on a monthly basis and talk about water and wastewater issues across the the state and, and get input um, um, from your office if there's any issues that you guys want us to look at and um, vice versa we bring um, maybe loan applications or possible uh, projects forward uh, to your guys' office on the water and wastewater side. The Southwest Healthcare Services project was a big project and I visited with our um, administrator there mm -hmm. and she said that um, you folks were so great that the, the daunting process of the application was a little scary to start with because it was so big. And she said that your office just was terrific in helping them through that. And um, I can tell you that without the, that particular project being funded, we would not be able to move forward with our health care and look into the future. And we need that. We really do need that. So we're grateful. I remember Fred Dingler was the state director, uh, and, and he was very progressive, like, like Jasper. They're looking for ways to help. You know, and I remember Charlie Mertens when he was the state director, looking for ways to help. And these are guys that came into the federal agency. They, they might have been doing something else before they came in, but they worked with that existing staff, and it's been remarkable. USDA never gets, in my opinion, anywhere near the political credit in, in the state of North Dakota that it deserves for economic development. But it's the big player, not the Department of Commerce, not the state of North Dakota, 
but they're run by politicians, and so they get a lot of credit for stuff. But it's USDA has been the anchor point for rural development in, in North Dakota. I uh, I have always treasured. Uh, I, I said earlier, treasured those relationships. I have noticed, uh, particularly in the last uh, year and a half to two years, it, it's always been wonderful. But I've noticed uh, a little more, uh, a little more assertiveness uh, from uh, folks in USDA rural development reaching out and saying, "How can we help?" And I've never had anyone not be helpful. But that little bit, uh, that little bit of extra reaching out, sure makes a difference in it. And uh, I think uh, our our uh, success uh, at the Strom Center, the programs we do, and and hearing very similar things uh, from various clients at the Strom Center who who are served by the Strom Center, saying very similar things about it. it's 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 uh, it's highly appreciated, makes a difference. And uh, any of us in government service, whether it's USDA rural development or university or whatever, uh, it's incumbent on us to remember that uh, we, have a, we have a covenant with the folks that provide our support, the citizens in our case of the state, the citizens in the case of USDA rural development, certainly the state, but the nation, uh, to do our very best each and every moment and, and try to serve our fellow citizens uh, in any way we can. I have seen some uh, some things that suggest some real nice innovations underway, and that's great. I can uh, I can say that uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had the chance to be in the uh, in the state headquarters, and to a person, I was greeted very positively, and it just felt good being in there. The 2.0 project and your visit to Bowman was terrific. I think it brought a lot of our community leaders together and let them see how much work is actually being done for our small communities by your organization. And sometimes, you know, I know because of all my state involvements, I know that there are a lot of good things being done for rural communities. But a lot of our um, leaders at many different levels within the community, whether it's business leaders or elected officials, don't necessarily understand the scope uh, of what is being done for us. So I think that was a very helpful tool to share with them, and um, it a lot of good has come out of it. What I liked about North Dakota 2.0, it was a focus on the territory that we serve. Uh, you know, we are rural electric cooperatives by and large. Uh, a lot of our folks uh, live and work in areas right outside of the major cities, and they're members of ours as well. But when you look at the land mass that we cover, it's gargantuan. We have like 63,000 miles of line that traverses every county in North Dakota, uh, serving the members that we have. And North Dakota 2.0 was the one effort where somebody shone a spotlight on the rural areas of the state. We got to really talk about what's going on in rural America. And I think this whole notion, again, of quality of life was apparent in the people who came to testify at those hearings, who brought their stories. They talked about the need for quality of life improvements in that range of services that I've already talked about. I think as importantly, what I found exciting about that was the number of success stories that are out there in rural America. And ranging from rural manufacturing to some of the you know, energy projects that are going on, some of the new efforts in renewable energies are very, very exciting. And we prove to ourselves that they can be done. And without 2.0, I think the spotlight never gets shown on those kinds of projects. And so it was very, very important that somebody raised it up to a level where it got some recognition, got some you know, noteworthiness, if you will, and we found it to be very uplifting for our membership and the people that we serve. When we came together and, and, and did the 2.0 exercise, you know, it was, it was a while before things got really a little bit out of hand here, but the, but the issues were starting to emerge. So in my mind, you know, USDA puts this, this effort together, gets this common voice, gets this common understanding of what the, what the coming needs are, and then the USDA people start looking at their programs and saying, how do we, how do we change, build, modify, adjust, outreach, 
shore up, kick back, whatever. How do we how do we make sure that USDA is relevant, timely, and responsive to these identified needs? And then I think that I'd like to think that USDA looks at places like the Strom Center and says, you as a partner who can be a partner in those solutions, here's how you can help us. At the same point, I'm looking to you because you helped me clarify that um, that big, broad sweep of vision. You know, when somebody says we have a problem with housing, it's such a big word. It's like somebody saying, you know, child care is an issue. Oh, where do we even start? You know, so being able to kind of fine tune it down and understanding what our role is, what role we can play, what piece we can pick up, which part, which leg of the race are we running on the baton and the relay here? You know, that's where I think it really becomes, that's why those initiatives are so important. And I know people get sick of planning and people get sick of talking and people get sick of meetings and I get that because we have work to do. But sometimes you have to take that time to sit down and be able to come together as a group and really think about where you want to go because if you don't have that then you got everybody running in 20 different directions thinking they're doing 20 different things and it lets you clearly articulate a vision and a direction that we can all take together which is why you have solutions starting to emerge I think we're going from the chaos now into the solution part of this as a region as a state you know first we're kind of identifying like oh my god what's happening and then we kind of like okay this is what's happening Here's maybe some of the things we can deal with. Now we're starting to go, how can we deal with that? And without that first document, or that first resource, how can you? Because it's all perceptive and it's all anecdotal, and anecdotal and perceptive doesn't get you anywhere when it comes to really putting things together. It might be your first insight as to what the needs are, but they have to be substantiated somehow quanti quantitatively. That's, I think, what, what, what 2.0 did a lot was give us a core place to go and say this is a strong voice of identified needs. That it happens to align very much with a lot of what some of the other places did just tells you that, that these really are solid needs. But I think you guys were one of the first ones to do some of the statewide planning too. Well, I think the, the best comment I could make is the fact that you were pulling people together from all walks of life to understand that there were a lot of common problems. Uh, maybe you had a local government entity that didn't realize that uh, maybe another agency or community within that region had some of the same problems and by by having those meetings I think uh, alone bringing that uh, group together and getting to interact is was extremely important and it's not really been done much in the state of North Dakota in the last 15 or 20 years so I think your organization's efforts were very uh, crucial to the success of rural communities because they're not little islands. Uh, almost all of them have very similar problems, and because of your efforts, you're, you know, obviously your meetings were bringing out a, a number of different issues, but it also got people together, and not just uh, those community leaders, but your organization and people that, other people you brought to those meetings. So I think that it really provided a very positive service to the communities, and, and it gave them a sounding board of issues. I think housing came out very strongly, and, and I think the people who attend your meetings realize that we all have that issue to a certain degree, and I think that was just a real plus. What, what I thought was exciting about North Dakota 2.0 that, that Jasper led was that it gave people an, a chance to talk through the politics of the day to what really matters to them. North Dakota people are way more homogenous than we thought, and here's what they care about. They, they care about their kids having a better life than they did, or at least as good. And, and they care about them being safe uh, and, and having meaningful work to do. So the, the political extremism that we're hearing today, and radical discussions about what's wrong with us, the North Dakota people really aren't there. They're thinking about how do we raise our kids in a healthy way. They like healthy neighborhoods. They care about child care. They care about health care a lot. And, and USDA has programs. You, you've financed all kinds of hospital expansions. And, and you know, you're, you're players in the things that people really do care about. And I think that level of leadership, continuing to talk to people, listening to them, taking off that political filter, saying, what, what do you really care about? What do you want your community to look like? When they give you an honest answer to what that community should look like, you got programs to help them get there. 
and, and people have way more power to implement their own future than they think they do. Uh, and, and if you take the trouble, you know, a disciplined listening, it's rewarding to me. And, and I, I think what, what uh, Jasper did with North Dakota 2.0 was listen. Well, I'd only just add that the Rural Electric Cooperative Movement in North Dakota has been built on a partnership. We've often said that if it weren't for this public-private partnership that we've had with the federal government through our financing programs and other kinds of programs, we wouldn't be as successful as we are today. Mm -hmm. you, you just couldn't get there without that initial help from the federal government. So we really have always tried to be very appreciative of the folks who work in, in rural development because we really need what you bring to the table and it's more than just the money. It is that expertise, it is that professionalism. So keep up the good work and we want to keep working with you. Well I think I think the more the employees can learn about the projects and the communities and the organizations that they're serving and working with, uh, I think that that would benefit them to put themselves in, in their shoes because I know that and it's true in any any industry, depending on what your position is in, in the organization, you sometimes get into your routine and you don't see the outside of it. But if you think of a small community uh, that's trying to build, let's say, a new nursing home or a new hospital, that's the dream of that community or that region, that county, is, is to make this happen. And I've always enjoyed seeing the USDA employees uh, come out to the project site be part of the groundbreaking, be part of the process, then I think it, it hits them what an impact their role has on this community or this region. It just comes back to roost that, that wow, this is really a good thing I was involved with. Well, one of the things, if I could emphasize, that if you take a look at your organization going back 20 or 25 years ago, and you look at how it is today, uh, you clearly provide that customer service far better than it did. Now, I'm not saying that it was a negative, in the before, but you've taken it up a whole different level, and I think that's really uh, one of the strengths of your organization. It's the people and where they're going. One of the things that I'm very aware of is that USDA, like many federal agencies, has, has continued to have more on their plate with less resources to do it. And so when I look even at our local office here in Dickinson, you know, how many people that I perceive used to be there versus what's there today and how jobs have changed and roles have changed and resources have changed. I think that, that the key to success for USDA, like any of us, is to continue to be open, friendly, and approachable. You know, I, I remember when I was, a, you know, starting one of my businesses and I was a, you know, kind of a young entrepreneur because I was younger than I am today. Um, and I got chased from one program to another program to another program, and it was very, very frustrating. Um, so I think being honest with what you can do to help people, you know, so that they don't feel that they're being disrespected, you know, disrespected, being truthful. I remember, you know, when I was a young woman and I was going to buy my first house and going to USDA and having somebody walk me through what it would take to be able to own my own home which was kind of out there 30 years ago. I was a single mom and, you know, I should be in an apartment somewhere. So when you, when you think about those things, I think that all goes back to being approachable, being honest, and, and being um, just friendly. And I, and I think that's a tough thing to say because we all are very, 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 very busy. And we all work in very difficult mental, I mean, we, I think we all work in heavy mental worlds. You know, so it's like we work on this really heavy stuff in our minds and then we have to flip on that friendly, nice face and that's hard to make that transition. Um, I think you guys do a good job of that. I think you already do a good job of that. And I, 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 I wish that at the end of the day you could look in the mirror and see you the way that, that the people that count on you and that work with you see you as these nice, friendly, approachable, helpful resources and not just the burden of your job because sometimes we don't see ourselves for the gifts that we are and I would suspect that you as USD employees suffer like anybody else with that whole burden of the crap and you never get to really sit back and see who you are from what you look like from the outside or you never get a chance to celebrate your successes I know when we got the Arbog early announcements out here 
it was like Christmas in southwestern North Dakota. All the lines were flying, everybody's texting everybody and calling everybody, and ooh, it's like Christmas. And we, and we, as a group, kind of made the comment, I wonder if it's this much fun for the USDA people, or if it's just like, file, done, put it away, and the next burden is before you. I hope you get time, and you take time, to celebrate those successes and to celebrate what difference you make. Because you know what? When I drive by the High Plains Cultural Center in Kildare now, and I see that open, I think, oh my God, we did it. You know, but if I'm sitting in Bismarck and I'm processing an application for a community facilities loan or community facilities grant, I might not ever really get that experience. So I think when you look at your progress report and when you look at these videos and when you look at the, the press releases that, that come out that say, this is what happened here, 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 that you really get, you really get the difference that you made in that happening. My, my first advice to anyone, and especially to USDA programs, is, is keep the long view. You will not necessarily, in your lifetime, see the results of your work. Don't despair because of that. Keep doing good work. Keep, keep working the trap line. Um, I got great advice from a retired clergy. I was complaining one time to him. Uh, he sang in the choir with me, and, and I was complaining about how frustrating the work was, and he said, you need to realize your work is not gonna be completed in your lifetime. That's true for USDA employees. You're building foundations that will last way beyond. You're, Abraham Maslow talked about the hierarchy of human needs, and we have a need for self-actualization. Give yourself to community development. Believe in it. And even though you might not see that project in your lifetime or in your career with USDA, that community has changed because you were there, because you made that commitment. A, sec a second thing I would advise people, don't take yourself too seriously. You've got lots of friends who believe in the common good like you do. It's, it's not that, well, I work for USDA. You're, you're a North Dakota citizen. You breathe the same air as everybody else does. It's not just the federal government. This is an opportunity to give back to your community uh, in, in a way that all of us have been given. And, and I, I think the platform of, of working for the federal government is, is a very viable, meaningful thing to do to advance the communities that you live in, work in. I, I think people should be grateful for that opportunity and they shouldn't squander it. That's why the organization is there. So I would ask all, all uh, USDA employees is to get active in your communities, talk to your fellow citizens, be part of groups, join up with folks who pay attention to the future of the state you're working in, and, and use your expertise to help guide you know, to the extent you can run for mayor, run for mayor, to the extent you can, you know, be in nonpartisan positions, do that. We, we need you. The, the state needs that active, awake involvement of, of USDA employees to guide the future of the state. Not, you're not going to dictate it, and we don't need you to do that, but we need you to share what you know and your concern. And, and this, it's, it's pretty easy for people to just drop out with busy lives and say, I, I don't mess with that stuff. But we need you at the, at the present time. Because of my heritage and background, I've worked with USDA broadly for, uh, for a long, long time. I won't even, I, 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 I'm not sure I can count that high. It, it's certainly far more than fingers and toes uh, as far as years. And uh, what, what people do, in, really makes a difference and it's it's whether you're out in the field visiting with clients or whether you're in the processing grants or whatever your role is what you're doing is making differences in entities and organizations businesses communities the various programs that are beyond just the types of things we do through the Strom Center but all of it in USDA rural development is making differences and it's making differences in the lives of individual human beings. And I just uh, say that uh, as you're going about your work, uh, it's the same thing we hope that, that our faculty and staff do with our students or the people we serve, that you're seeing that you're, uh, you've got a chance to make a difference in a human being's life.
I'll use I'll use one piece and, and, and if I take just a second it's one that's an education piece but I think it, it could apply and, and, and you might want to think I had a chance to do a, a uh, an educational leadership development program at Harvard a number of years ago we spent one of the people that came and presented to us was a fellow named Arthur Levine who was a faculty member in in their education programs at Harvard then. He went on to become uh, uh, president of, of Teachers College of the uh, City University of New York system, and he now heads up the Fulbright uh, Foundation uh, that sends people all over the world and people come in. Very thoughtful person. He spent an entire day working with us. At the end of the day, he said, I want to leave you with one thought. He said that one thought is, some of the things you do make incredible differences in people's lives. Some of the things you do. The challenge is when you're doing them, you don't know which ones those are. So you must do everything you do as well as it can possibly be done and as well as you can possibly do it. Because that may be the turning point for a person, a family, an organization, an entity. And I would, uh, I would ask uh, each person as part of uh, the North Dakota Office of USDA Rural Development to think about that. The things you do, we know they're important, and they will have, uh, they will have effects on people's lives, communities, and our state and region beyond anything that we today can foresee. So, thank you. The only thing that you didn't ask that I didn't get to say is that I'm going to say it right into the camera. I love USDA and I love the people who work there. I think you are incredible rock stars and I hope, I hope, I hope you know that. Thank you for all you do.